Hello, my name is Ray Hughes and I'm an interviewer for the Veterans History Project out of Washington, D.C. and conducted by the Cincinnati Hamilton County Public Library. And the man in charge of that program is our cameraman today, Mr. Brian Powers. Today's date is the 2nd of August, 2016. And this interview is being conducted at the Cincinnati Hamilton County Public Library. Today we have the real honor and privilege of interviewing a World War II veteran, Wilbur E. Johnston, who was a member of the 15th Air Force flying B-24s out of Italy during World War II. And it's a real pleasure to meet you this morning. Thank Mr. You. Johnson, is it all right just to call you Will? Will is better, yeah. Okay. I never used Wilbur. Okay. The Wright brothers used them. Yeah. I just used Will. Okay. Uh, well, if we could, we'd get some biographical information first. Uh, uh, where were you born and the date of your birth, please? In Sydney, Ohio, uh, March the 21st, 1925. I see. And, uh, and you, what were your parents' names? Uh, Millard and Bertha Johnson. He uh, worked in the, he went to the eighth grade in school and uh, ended up, he was superintendent of a tanning company in Sydney. There's not many tanning companies in the world anymore, I not see. in the United States. And was your father from Sydney, Ohio? He was from Covington. My mother and father were both from Covington, Ohio. Mother was a school teacher. And what was your mother's maiden name? Bertha well, Fletcher. Fletcher. And were your parents longtime residents and your grandparents of Ohio? Yes. I see. They were born, both of them, in Covington. I see. And uh, what schools did you go to, uh, Will? I went to the schools in, in grade school and high school at Sydney High School, and then I went to a school in Columbus, Ohio State University. I went to dental school and at Ohio State. I see. So you, uh, you remember the year you graduated from high school? 1943. 1943. Yeah. I enlisted in the Army. I went down to Wright Field and enlisted at, uh, on my birthday and before March the 21st in 1943 and then finished, they let me finish high school and the second day after graduation I was off to the cadet program. I see. And, um, and where was your first station then? Well, uh, Biloxi, Mississippi. I went to basic training down in Biloxi, Mississippi. Took a train from Cincinnati down to Biloxi and went to basic training down there in the summertime. It was June and pretty warm. Yeah. How long was basic in those days at Biloxi? I don't remember just how long it was. It was not very long. And uh, we did uh, went swimming in the Gulf of Mexico. I know we weren't supposed to, but. Uh, we got cool off down there. <laughs> I see. Now, was that a pretty strenuous basic training? No, no, not well. I played a lot of sports in high school, football, basketball, track, tennis, everything. And so uh, I was in pretty good physical shape when I went in. I see. Now, if you weren't doing some activity, it, it would probably be pretty strenuous. But every place that I went to a service, they always had special teams. And I always went out for either the softball team or basketball team, whatever it was. I didn't do much marching. I see. Uh, after Biloxi, uh, where did you go? Well, they sent me uh, to, uh, yeah, I was trying to see, went to, uh, I was going to go to navigation school. So that before I went there, they uh, sent me to Las Vegas to gunnery school before navigation school opened up. So and from Biloxi, you went to gunnery school I right went, away? Well, I was waiting on the navigation school. I asked for pilots training, and there were three of us that uh, said we would. Uh, we asked for pilot, but we wanted to be, they asked if we'd be navigators, and all three of us said we would. So that worked out fine. And I went to uh, a college training detachment in Oregon. That was probably the best place that I went. It was a little college. It was Eastern Oregon State Teachers College of Education. The name was longer than the school was big, but uh, they didn't teach me to study because I didn't do much besides play sports and chase girls in high school. I see. 
Tell us about this gunnery training that you had in Las Vegas. You know, that was a, that was a good time out there. They had all sorts of programs. You shot shotguns in the back of trucks. That was the most fun, where they'd take you around a course and they'd have uh, targets would fly towards you. Some of them would be flying away from you, coming in sideways to teach you relative motion because you were in the back of a truck standing up with a ring around your waist and have shotgun shells in there. Well, after we did this a couple of days, we always took an extra bo box of shells and we had people getting two targets out so they shoot doubles up there. So uh, they, it was all good fun. There wasn't uh, much work. Well, they did teach you to shoot crap out there. The people that were permanent parties there, they knew what a crap table was and uh, what money was left. Well, I think the permanent people got most of that. I, and I think that you, uh, they actually uh, had you training like in a ball turret? Yeah, I was 6'2 at the time. I've shrunk now, I think I'm 6'1. But they had me in a ball turret and it would just go down upper turret, lower turret, uh, tail gunner, waist, and that. And I could have bitten everything besides that ball turret, but I had to sit on my feet and operate the handles, the, the operating of it, with my hands in there. And the only thing I had shot at was from air to ground, where we'd be strafing down there. But I could operate that with my hand, but I had to sit on my feet. I, did, I wouldn't be able to do much good as yeah. a permanent. You were too president. tall to be in a ball turret. Oh, yeah. yeah. They always had the smallest ball. They're, they're normally out of the target going over the turret anyway. And our ball turret man was about, oh, I guess he was about 30. And uh, he would throw chaff out, which was, metal stripping like you put on a Christmas tree, and that was to d disrupt the, the radar equipment that the Germans had. So he would throw that out while he was out of his turret until he got back in the turret after he got off the target. Uh, while you're doing this uh, ball turret training and gunnery training, uh, do you know that you're going to go to navigator school at this time? Oh, yeah. Oh, you? Yeah, they just... They took you down the list, and you're one. You're a nose gunner, upper turret, ball turret, waist gunner, you know, tail gunner. So you're just waiting though to go to navigator oh, school yeah, while you're I was doing this. To go to navigation school. I wasn't gonna. I couldn't even fit in there. I had to use yeah. it, uh, do all the work with my hands. I couldn't use my feet in the turret. I had to sit on them. So, so uh, after na uh, this gunnery training, then did you go to for navigation training? Well, I went to a school up in Oregon. This is called the Eastern Oregon State Teachers College of Education. It was a, a real nice school. I didn't do much study in high school. I studied a, a little bit, but uh, I played a lot of sports. You know, I got 11 letters in high school, varsity letters, and uh, played a lot of sports and chased a lot of girls, but I uh, didn't do a whole lot of studying. <laughs> Got what what city, city in uh, Oregon yeah. was this? La Grande. La Grande. In the northeastern part. I see. see. And um, northwestern part of the state. I'm sorry. Tell right. us something about your navigation training and uh, what that entailed. Well, it was. Uh, <coughs> it, uh, navigation. Um, did you have to learn to shoot the stars, as they say? Oh, yeah, or? we had celestial navigation, but all of our missions were day missions. And the only time I ever did any uh, celestial navigation was flying back after the war in a beat up airplane that had been marked for salvage and uh, I'd shoot a couple of uh, noonday uh, fixes on the sun. and. Uh, but it, it going through school, we use the stars and the different constellations, and there were a lot of night missions. But in the war over there, all of our missions were day missions that we flew. I see. And how long was that uh, Corsair at? Uh, how long was what? Was the Corsair at uh, in Oregon? Your navigation. Oh, well, that was uh, in Oregon. Uh, it, it wasn't. It was only about. Six weeks, I guess, 
but I didn't do much studying in high school. I was more interested in sports and other activities. Yeah. And so they did teach me to study there, and that was a big blessing. I, they had a good program there for us. While you're going through this training, though, what rank are you? Well, you were just a cadet at the time. I think you got 75 hours a month rather than 50 or whatever it was. And when you got out, you got out as a second lieutenant, and I think second lieutenant made you know, 150, and a first lieutenant made 160, and then you got flight pay with 50% of that, and then you got overseas pay where you were flying to combat. You made more money shooting crap than you did uh, flying airplanes. <laughs> Um, so, uh, after graduation, uh, you're made a second lieutenant no. after graduation from navigation school. Um, where did you go? You went from Oregon to Texas and Colorado also. Yeah. Uh, after your training there at navigation school and you become a second lieutenant, where was your next uh, station? In uh, Lincoln, Nebraska. And we had a phase training where they brought the pilots together, the navigators, the bombardiers, and we trained in, in uh, Pueblo, Colorado. And they'd teach the pilots to fly formation, and we got ready to go overseas. And what, what kind of a plane were you flying there in Colorado? Uh, these were, uh, well, in Colorado. Uh, I'm trying to think of the. Uh, well, we'll come back to that. Okay. From Colorado, where did you go? From Colorado? Oh, that was after I'd. <clears throat> that was, we had phase training there. That's when they brought the pilots, the bombardiers, and together, and we flew as a crew, and they taught the pilots and things. They'd fly formations and things like that. So we trained out there I, maybe about six weeks, I guess. While you were there, did, did you and that crew stay together afterwards? Yeah. Okay. And they, they probably selected, they, we flew lead crew after about our, maybe about our 10th mission. But this and was going to be the cohesive yeah, team. Yeah, uh, this is the pilot and the bombardier and I. Yeah. What were their names, do you recall? Yeah, Larry Burton, he was a policeman, a 29-year-old policeman from L.A. Taught me a lot of bad habits. And my pilot, he was from Macon, Georgia, and uh, he had never. What was his name? Uh, John uh, Anderson. And his, uh, he was from Macon, Georgia, and he had nothing to do with blacks. We played basketball, football, all sports with him up in Ohio. And this was the kind of a cultural shock for him. And when we got shot down and had to crash land at that field and lived with those people, for about four days, he would eat his meals and go back into the tent and read a book. Well, we'd go up and, and drink at their bar, and when they go to briefing in the morning, and uh, when the planes would come in, it looked like a bunny line at a basketball game. They'd go over the field and go with some fancy gyrations before they got down back in the traffic pattern to land. They put on a pretty good show out there. Uh so from Colorado, you've been assigned to a uh, crew. Yeah. Do and you then, do you know you're going on a B-24 yet? Uh, yeah, we trained out there in B-24s. Ah. And then we uh, went to Newport News to uh, go over the Navy. We went on a livery ship, and we could have swam faster than that boat went. It took us 28 days to go from Newport News to Naples, Italy. and. Uh, there wasn't much to do on the, the boat, you know, just 28 days you just spent on the boat. Are, are the rest of your crew with you by this time? Yeah, we were all together. The uh, the gunners? Yeah, they, were, they, they had racks where they slept. They went slept about, I think it was four or six high back there. And I normally got on a first or second level bunk. I didn't care about climbing up there and falling out of bed at night. Or, and How many men were on a, a, the crew of a B-20? Ten. Ten? Ten. You know, there were four officers, a pilot, a co-pilot, navigator, bombardier, then the nose gunner, upper turret gunner, ball turret gunner, two waist gunners, radio operator, and a tail gunner. I see. And, um, and these men were all with you while you were going overseas? Yeah. Okay. But we, we didn't, it wasn't a social trip there. 
In fact, they put me in a, they had some sort of a raffle and they had little compartments and they had about five people in there, in a room, and like in a closet. And uh, so I gave that to somebody else and went out and slept with where I could stretch out and oh, move around a little bit. Yeah. So you land in Naples. In Naples, yeah. Um, and this is, we, wh it, when was this when you landed in Naples, roughly? Well, it was during the football season, because I had a good friend that was playing football up at Ohio State named Dick Flanagan. They were national champions that year. And I listened to the Ohio State-Michigan game on the radio, um, and the ship going over. Uh. And. Uh, so what, did you stay in Naples very long? No, we went, the, uh, they, they sent us to, they gave us a little time off, or not time off, they sent us to, uh, from Naples, they sent us to, um, oh, it was about 20 miles north of Naples, and uh, they had us there for a couple of days. Well, the bombardier and I, he was, a uh, my led me astray. He's the one that we, we took us into Naples, and uh, we borrowed a jeep and drove back 28 miles from the Bank of Naples Officers Club down there. Him driving the jeep, I'd never even been in a jeep before. He this did. is the policeman from L.A. Oh, and he just picked the jeep he up. He picked and the jeep up, and there was a key in it. Turned it on. He says, "Hop in." So <laughs> we drive back to the base and walk into the camp and left the car parked on the side of the road out there. And he was a little different. He wasn't my, my boy scout leader. <laughs> so from um, from Naples, where did they send you? Well, they sent me uh, Fort Nova. Uh, it was the name of the little town where our base was, where the 746th bomb group was, and uh, they they sent us there and. A lot of those boys What was the name of that town again? Ordnova. Ordnova? Yeah. And uh, it was up close to Foggia. It was about 20 miles from Foggia. They didn't have any plumbing or anything. The women would they'd take the dump water that they had or throw it out in the streets, you know. There was no sanitation there. The kids would run around with no shoes and in the wintertime and uh, begging for candy or cigarettes. <laughs> And uh, it wasn't a very good location for the Italian people, but they. Uh, and, and, but that's where your air base was. That's where our air base was. Did they have a name of that for that air base? Well, it, it was a four, or 746 bomb. It was a Squadron. 456 bomb group, and they had a wing headquarters, I think, in Foggia, and they had. Uh, they have four squadrons to a group and four groups to the wing and four wings to the Air Force, I think that's how it was. And um, these different squadrons, though, were at different locations. Yeah. Yours was located at Ordnova, Ordnova though? Ordnova. Uh -huh. And you had regular right runway? Right by Foggia, not, huh. not, about 20 miles from Foggia. And you had your own runways and things there? Oh, yeah, they yeah. were all metal strips. They weren't, they didn't receive men or anything in there. And in fact, we lived in tents, they had four officers, and they had six enlisted men would be in their enlisted men area, and uh, slip on cots, and we had a, uh, a pump gasoline, just live gasoline, and the high power gasoline coming through, and, and it come to the middle of the tent, and they had a, they'd cut a, a barrel off halfway up, and had an opening to put a, 20 millimeter shell in there. They punched holes in that, and they poured the gasoline in that, and that's what we light. And that was our heat. That was and your occasionally, burner. Occasionally, occasionally the tent would burn down. You know, not ours, but uh, they had some. That would what, burn down. what about breathing the uh, the fumes and things? Well, uh, that's what they gave you. You just slept on a cot and kept. So going. that's what kept you warm. Yeah. Uh, you remember the uh, uh, about. When you arrived at Ord Nova, what, what month? Well, yeah, I was. I had a friend of mine that was playing football at uh, Ohio State. Uh, Dick Flanagan was the name. Played pro football later on, and uh, I listened to the Ohio State Michigan game on the boat going over. So it was in December there. Okay. And when we started to fly, why? Well, I, I think our 
got my first 15 missions were to either Vienna, Munich, or Linz. And I went to briefing the first day, and I see Munich up there. Never heard of that. Next day we go to Wien. We find out that it was Vienna, Vienna. and the other was Munich. And the other town up there was Linz, L-I-N-Z. That was as far as they could get boats up the Danube in the winter time. The boats couldn't go any further north than that. So that was one of our bigger targets, but Munich and Linz. But my first 15 missions were all of those three. And uh, What was your first mission? I, I was trying to think. I think it was uh, Schell's Floridorf. It was a shell station in Vienna. And uh, But those were the three towns that we did all of our bombing after a while. If you went above 47 degrees north, got heavy flak or fighters at the target, they'd give you a double mission credit. You had to fly 35 sorties. That was a trip out dropping your bombs and back. We didn't have any that we didn't get shot at. <laughs> we flew, had to fly 35 missions. We ended up like 57 missions and 35 sorties. I see. Um, when you're bombing, uh, your first missions were at uh, Munich, Linz, and Vienna. Vienna, yeah. And they were uh, all mostly marshalling yards up there, the train stations, you know. And if you could tie up the, the uh, well, sometimes you went to the oil refineries, you know, and we, that, like I said, I think the first target was the Shell Floresdorf, the northeastern part of Vienna. And they had a park up there that had a big Ferris wheel I couldn't see it from the air. I saw it later on, and uh, but uh, those are the main, main targets. And I think 14 of the first 15 were all of those three. And if you went above 47 degrees north and got heavy flacker fighters at the target, they gave you double missions. But it was a, a sortie. It was a trip out, dropping your bombs and coming back. Oh. We didn't have any what they call milk runs, where you didn't get shot at. You know. You, are you flying uh, in a lead position or back in the uh, formation? Well, it depended. After about eight or ten missions, we flew lead then uh, on most of our missions. And uh, on my birthday, we bombed the last jet field in Germany. This is and March of 1944? No, it was on my birthday. It was March 44, March 21st. And we got a distinguished flying car. I did because we led the Air Force that day on a mission to the last jet field in Germany. Where was that at? At Newburgh, N-E-U-B-E-R-G. Uh, Newburgh. It ended up that my uh, a fellow that came to our church, a girl sang in our, the choir up there. Her husband was uh, with a German up there, and. Von Ohain was his name, and he invented the jet airplane. And he came back and lived in Kettering, and was a dental patient of mine after the war. He and he had another fellow that was, did pretty well with the artillery pieces. You know. What was what was his name again? Von Ohain was his name, Hans Von Ohain. And what did he invent? He, he invented the first jet airplane, the 262 that they had. And he became a member of, uh, he was a dental patient of yours yeah, after the war? Yeah, he went to church, there was Dick Hartman, he remembers him. I think you were there, weren't you, Dick? And his wife was a vocalist, she was a soloist for our choir. So he immigrated to the United States he after came, the war? Yeah, they sent him and uh, the fellow that was the hot shot with the uh, anti-aircraft that, uh, I was trying to think of his name, I used to know it pretty good. But they brought the two of them, they were the Hitler's two whiz kids, they were young kids at that time, were the one who invented the jet plane, and they took them out of production about two months before the war ended. You know, they had their plane flying, but they didn't get them in big production. They wouldn't have changed the course of the war, but they would have lengthened the war mm -hmm. had they been able to go into production. Well, you're doing your first uh, 14th and 15th mission. Are you running into a lot of flak? Yeah, we didn't fly any missions when we go to Linz and Vienna. Munich, they have like, they have, in, the, the flak guns were 88 millimeters, they, which were a, a field artillery piece. They had the 105s and the 155s, and uh, they had different color. You could see what color they were, but the 88s were the, they put the guns together in eight or 10 or 12 gun batteries where they'd fire one gun and all 10 or 12 of them would go off. 
Well, if you were later going in after several planes and they saw where the IP was and where the planes were flying over, they uh, put the flak up and at that time, for that five minutes that you, when you left the IP and went to the target, you, then you moved your formation together and they were just wing over wing, you know, they'd stack them down to one plane up here, three and four down here, and the four down here, and then five and six, and you might have nine or, you know, 11 planes, you know, in a group going over. Did you lose many planes on your miss first 15 missions? Well, we lost planes on a lot of missions, yeah. The worst one we had, uh, they came in and told us the war was in a, such a crucial state and we wouldn't think of sending new men out in weather like this. But uh, they had, we, were go, we, were, we were the last group taken off in the Air Force that day and uh, they lost, I think it's 14 planes and nobody got over 100 miles from the base. But they were up there when a plane, when you could look out the window, you could see another plane going over and you couldn't see the end of your wing. Why well, I, I knew at that time that why well, I didn't want to spend much time there because we were the last group taken off. So we went over to Yugoslavia and, and I, we got up as high as 28,000 feet and they told me that the B-24 couldn't fly at 28,000 feet. Well, we flew at 28,000 feet over there and uh, we got back, we just wasted time until those other planes got back and landed. But they lost, I think it was 28 planes and nobody got over 100 miles from the base. But they said the war was in such a crucial state we had to get through it. And they we know you men can do it and nobody, <laughs> it's a big foul up of the war for us. Did they lose those planes because of weather? Well, they just made air collisions. They had all these planes trying to fly. They got off, they should have never taken off, you know. But they said that we could do it, you know. Well, yeah. we didn't do it. Yeah. And we didn't get mission credit for that. Yeah. yeah. Um, you mentioned IP. That's uh, the initial point. And that's that, when you start on your target. And now, at that time, then you close your formation in. Bombardier gets his bomb sight going, and uh, then he would be in control of the plane because you just you, they'd want to drop in the best pattern that you could. But you want your bombs dropping as close together. So you'd not overlap, you'd be the first plane to be up here, and the second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, on down. And uh, you didn't, couldn't be in the prop horse of another plane. And, but you, when, uh, when you dropped your bombs, they would drop on the lead plane in each squadron. And that's what the bombardier would do. And when he'd drop his bomb, everybody else would toggle their bombs on so we'd get a good pattern down there and they would grade you on if how many what percentage of bombs you had, you know, within 100 feet or 200 feet or. Now you had cameras taking pictures yeah, of this? Yeah, they took pictures of everything. I used to got, that's where the, some of the pictures I got yeah. there. And then when you get back, you go through debriefing and. Yeah, you'd go to the group headquarters and they'd give you a report and they would talk to you if you any, any planes were shot down or if you saw any parachutes, you know, come out or what time fighters, you know, attack the formation and anything that was pertinent they wanted to know. And you went to briefing and then they had girls that give you a donut and a cup of coffee up there. When you got back to your base, uh, the surgeon there, he had a tent and he had a table out there with a board on and uh, he had uh, booze that he put in a water glass and you could have uh, about half a water glass, and he'd give you two of those. And so we had some enlisted men that didn't drink, but they liked candy and cigarettes. So we'd give them our candy and cigarettes, and they'd come up and sign their name. So my bombardier, <laughs> my, my policeman from LA, <laughs> why we would have about four big shots of, of booze before five o'clock, and hadn't, hadn't eaten anything since about five in the morning. And you'd go back and see if you were going to fly the next day. If you were going to fly, you just kept on drinking. If you were going to fly, you, that was the end of the drinking for the day. <laughs> so it was a growing up stage for the 18 year old or 19 year old boy. Yes. How old were you at that time? 19. 19? Yeah. Uh, and just for the people who might be watching this, once you reached that IP, 
<clears throat> the pilot was no longer in control of the plane. It was turned over to the bombardier. Bombardier, yeah. And the bombardier. Once he fixed up to the target, now my bombardier, he wouldn't get on the extent. He'd want to get a nose in the bomb sight, and we'd start down on the target there, and I'd be straddled him, one leg over his back, or both legs just straddling, and uh, he would have control of the plane then, and uh, but he would want to get his nose into that bomb sight, you know, and I'd want him to pick up the target and then start thinking about the bomb sights, you know. And but he was good when he he dropped it. He, we were pretty lucky. We flew lead crew and he we had some good hits. I got a bunch of bomb strike photos over there. Yeah. And uh, so it worked out fine. Well when you started this you you uh you outlined it as your first 15 missions. Um, why don't you go on with the rest of your missions for us then? Well, I got everything listed with the date and the length of the flight of each mission that I was on. At the end of the war, we w went on one special mission. They had a new bomb or something. I didn't know what it was. They had uh, three planes and we were to go down to Naples and uh, bomb uh, uh, anti-aircraft battery and they'd have like I say eight or ten or twelve guns with one battery and they'd shoot every time they'd shoot it all twelve guns would go off and uh, so this was a, a sh new thing that they had I we had no idea what it was so they told us what it was and they called it the daisy cutter and the thing was that they would drop the bomb down and when it got about 50 feet above the ground it would detonate rather than drop the bomb into the ground and the explode, everything would be into the ground. But this, they called it a daisy cutter, and the idea was to knock out the anti-aircraft before the planes were, over. I don't know how successful it was, but uh, they sent three planes up there that was one of our missions. <laughs> was that <laughs> one of your missions yeah, too? Uh -huh. And where was uh, that, what city was that? In Northern Italy, just uh, in Verona, I think it was. Verona? Verona. Uh-huh. Uh, were you hit by any flak on that mission, on that mission there? No, were you? not on that mission. There's only three planes going up, and we normally had big formations going up. And, uh, but we, we, went, we didn't go at a real high altitude, because this was a new bomb that they could detonate and make it explode, you know, 50 or 100 feet above the ground, and the idea of that was to knock out the gunners in those anti-aircraft. Right. So that was just a special mission. We didn't know much about it. Uh-huh. I have to put my glasses on for this. Um. Those are lists of the missions, I think, there. I, um, I was trying to find a city that that was, um, I notice here that you have uh, Moose Beer Bomb. Moose Beer Bomb, yeah. That was up north of Munich. It was a big oil producing area there. That was one of the targets. Uh, and I notice also that you bombed Regensburg. Yeah. At the. They had fighters. You that's where they made the Messerschmitt, wasn't yeah, it? They did. Yeah. Is that the plant you bombed there? Uh, was that your target? or? Yeah, well, it was the, the factory. Yeah. yeah. I don't know if we hit it or not. Yeah. We had, we got, it brought pictures back of the bomb strike photos, the ones that were decent that you could see what was happening. Yeah. Uh, but they would grade you on what percentage of your shells got within, you know, 100 feet and 200 feet. Yes. Um, this uh, city of uh, Maribor. Maribor. Yeah. Yeah. They they were good. They didn't have many guns, but we didn't go over that town many times that they didn't shoot somebody down. They had a school down there for their anti-aircraft people, and they were pretty good. It's a little town. It wasn't much significance, but it was a thing that the Germans had. Uh, Marlboro was not a good place to go. And I noticed Vienna. Vienna. What that, targets that, were in Vienna, Austria? Well, the, the big targets was Shell had a, the Floresdorf refineries up there in the northeastern part of the town. 
They had a big Ferris wheel up there. I couldn't see the Ferris wheel. I saw it later on, you know. But uh, there was a Shell Oil refinery up there right. in the northeastern part of the town, and they were good. But they had have uh, Munich and Linz and uh, Vienna. Well, uh, Linz didn't have as many guns as uh, Munich or uh, Vienna did, but they'd have these eight and ten gun batteries that one guy would shoot, one guy would be directing all eight or ten of their shells, and if you had a couple groups flying in ahead of you and they knew where your pattern was, they'd bring railroad cars up with guns on those and did all sorts of things. They were pretty good. With it. It'd take them 15 seconds to compute your altitude and get a shell up to you. So when we drop the bombs, I changed course. I'd say right, right, level, left, left, level, and so I knew which direction I was going to. We tried to get off going downwind when you're dropping your bomb. When you're going upwind, you don't want to do that. It slows you down a little too much. And we'd go about 150 miles an hour, but if we had a 20 or 30 mile an hour wind, we were going about 180. So we're going three miles an hour. When you, when you would come back from these missions, <coughs> and you went through your debriefing and stuff like that. Um, did you, um, I read sometimes about where the guys would come back and they would see empty bunks and things like that and you knew that the crews. Did what? You saw empty bunks where you knew men weren't gonna come back from these missions. Yeah, yeah. We, we had tents and we had four officers in each tent and it had six enlisted men. Our crew was 10 people and uh, they slept in one tent, and a, they ate separate, and the officers ate, you know, in another tent. We went to briefings together, the officers did, or the navigators and the pilots. We got an orientation first. There'd be a big map up on the wall with some red string going up, seeing where we were going to go and where our target was. And like I say, we were kind of green as grass when they say bean or Mutant, I had no idea where we were going. That I was soon Mu found out where yeah. we were going. Munich and Vienna, yeah. yeah. Um, the, uh, did you uh, socialize much with other crews while you were back at your base? Oh, at the base, yeah. When we, the days we didn't fly, we'd have, the weather was good, we'd have softball games, or, and uh, we had out in a, we were in an olive orchard out there, and uh, we had a couple of dogs that were in the, in the our squadron there that would go around to the different tents and everything. We'd take them out there and chase those rodents out of the field, and there's they would shake their tail off before they would run, you know. And they were rats, you know, like a rat. And but they could shake their tail off and lose it, and they evidently grow a new tail, you know, later on. But we used to take dogs out and chase. Uh, animals around out in the field when we weren't flying to uh, spend some time. A lot of guys uh, on their planes, they had a painting or, or yeah. a, a name of a plane. Did your plane have any? Uh, yeah, we had an interesting one. Uh, we, our pilot, they, you could name a plane, but we didn't fly the plane very often. It was a plane that was a lead plane and we had uh, navigation equipment and radar equipment on it and uh, we would uh, we didn't normally give us a lead plane to fly but a lot of times we didn't uh, get assigned that plane you know we, they had certain planes that were lead that they had the radar equipment and everything on and you were just assigned to a plane you so you do your group lead and your uh, deputy lead they both have extra equipment you know in case we had to drop by radar equipment. Uh, but the normal plane you were assigned to, did you have a name for it or a, oh, a, anything? I, mean, I had a bunch, um, uh, one was a misconduct, M-I-S-S, -S, conduct, and they'd have somebody, they'd give a crew chief that had a paintbrush, uh, a fifth of whiskey, and he'd go paint a picture on a plane and put the name of it on there. But we didn't fly, we just, we had to fly lead planes after so long, after we flew lead and group lead, why you always had special planes, you know, but you didn't know which plane you were gonna fly that day. 
what were um, I, uh, some of the most uh, significant targets you had and the most dangerous targets you had during the war? Well, the ones I mentioned first, the Vienna, Munich, and Linz. And like I say, I had no idea where Wien was or where Munich was, I found out. Yeah. Uh, and there were some of the in Regensburg and some of them had. You bombed Regensburg several times. Yeah. And um, they, I think they had an aircraft factory there in Regensburg. Yeah, if I remember correctly, they produced Messerschmitt there. I think yeah. so. At, uh, you also bombed uh, Vienna many times. Yeah. At, um, was your plane hit very often by flak? Uh, most of <laughs> they, they had holes in, you know. But uh, we, the pilot, he got hit in the shoulder once. We didn't have anybody killed. We had people, but we'd have oxygen checks about every 10 minutes. You'd say, nose pilot or nose gunner, okay, navigator, okay, bombardier, and go back through the crew. And if somebody didn't answer, why well, then somebody looked into him. A lot of times you'd get moisture inside of the mask and they had a flutter valve in there and you had to crack that break the ice off that. If the ice would fill that up, you couldn't get the oxygen that you needed at that height. These are not pressurized planes. No. So you're flying at the temperatures. What's, what are the temperatures in that plane? 56 below zero is the lowest I ever got. That's cold. And uh, you didn't want to have many skin exposed or anything. <laughs> because did, it'll whip in there and burn you pretty bad. Did you, you have you, much? You were covered up, you know, with, we had, uh, uh, electric heating suits that we wore in there we could plug into and got heat in there. And uh, I always had a pair of shoes, other walking shoes, that I, I had in my hand or I could stick it on my belt if I bailed out. You, you wanted to have shoes when you got on the ground because a lot of times your boots would go off, you know, when you went out. And uh, they gave you a I, an escape kit thing that had a map in there and a package of cigarettes, not a pack, but about six cigarettes in there and uh, some money, maybe uh, 100 lira or 50 lira that you could buy something on the ground or trade it. And it had a message there that they, anybody could read it and tell them to take you to the nearest partisan headquarters, you know, and, and then they would be repaid, you know, for taking you there. Um, on another subject, uh, I know you mentioned something about the uh, Tuskegee Airmen. Yeah, we uh, crash landed at their field. Sir? I say we crash landed at their field. That's when my pilot was from Macon, Georgia and had nothing to do with, you know, blacks and all. And we played football and all sports with them back home, you know, in Ohio. And uh, my pilot would, he'd eat and then go back to his tent and read a book, you know. And I got a thing that the Tuskegee Airmen, I told his son and his grandson about our staying there about three days and how well they treated us. And there's a letter in there that uh, she donated $10,000 to the Tuskegee Airmen. And Who did? A, Who? The, the, my pilot's wife. Oh. My pilot, he, would, he wouldn't have given him 15 cents probably. Who was his son and grandson? That wasn't John Lear's family, was it? No. His grandson. Uh, you said you talked with the son and grandson of the Tuskegee Airmen? Oh, I talked to uh, the Tuskegee Airmen. We were there about three days and they treated us great. We'd go yeah. to briefing in the morning and watch the planes come in, you know, afterwards to put on their little air show before they got in the traffic pattern and come in, but they just treated us wonderful. What mission were you on that you had to crash land there? Oh, God, it was... Late, I don't know what, oh, I think we were up around, we were north, I know, we were north of Munich, and uh, I th think it was a Messers, uh, the, where they made Messersmiths up there, and we were only about 40 miles from uh, the uh, border there where we could get in to and could bail out, and I, I suggested that we go there when my, like I said, my pilot and his co-pilot wife were both pregnant. They didn't want to be missing in action. That's when we 
flew back got o down over the Alps and got over the water and they talked to us about landing the plane in the water and didn't want you don't practice doing that too often. So we got back to that uh, base where we landed the Negro fighter strip. Was that Foggia? Or well, not far. Our base was at Foggia. Oh. And there were out, Italy is like a boot and then there's a spur out there about halfway up from the boot up to the top of the Adriatic and uh, their base was up there on the spur. I see. And we had no idea where we were landing. We just landed at the field where they take us in and it happened to be this Negro fighter strip. And they treated us great. But Mrs. Roosevelt, Franklin's wife, he, uh, she, she went somewhere and flew with one of the Tuskegee Airmen. He took her up on a, a ride, you know, mm -hmm. and she came back and talked to the president and said these people have been out of training, you know, and they wouldn't send them overseas. A lot of the southern uh, congressmen and things didn't think that blacks could fly, you know, combat. Well, they got into combat and they did a great job because they didn't lose many planes. When a plane would leave formation, they didn't send one plane, they'd send three or four planes back. So if they sent something up, why, they could take care of the enemy fighters. You know, they'd right. go up to get a cripple, but only it's flying on three engines trying to get back. How bad was your plane uh, hit? What was? Uh, well, we got our hydraulics shot out, so we couldn't stop the plane. That's when we had to put the parachutes on the waist guns, you know, and and trip those out the window. You didn't want to hold the parachute and pull the ripcord. You put it on a gun mount on your. You had 250 caliber guns on the uh, halfway back on the waist gunners, and so you could put it on there. And once you hit the ground, then they'd pull the ripcord and the parachutes would open and would slow the plane down so we stopped because there'd be no way of stopping the plane, you know, unless we did that. That was a brilliant uh, idea to do that. Yeah, it was smarter than some of them. One guy, they said that he was back there and they told him to go back and pull his ripcord, you know, when they touched the ground and he forgot to unbuckle. So I'm sure he was decapitated or, or dead. But it may have been a story to make sure everybody put it on a gun mount rather than put yeah. it on yourself and trying to stop an airplane. How long did you spend, was your plane uh, ever operable again? Did you, were you able to use that plane oh, again? Well, I don't know if it, when they, they had to tow it back, they, they sent people up to try and uh, to do the repairs on it when they found out what it needed. And then they probably flew it back to our base, you know. I see. Later on. How long did you spend there with the... Uh, Just three days. Three days? But they treated us great. Did like you get involved in any sports with them while you were there? No. No. Well, I, I drank more with them. Did you? They had a good time. They could do that. Did and you? They went to briefing with them. I went to missions. I went to the... Uh, when they would come in and after the missions, you know, you would go when they had reports, you know, what their action was for the day. But they did a great job and treated us great. And, like I say, my pilot, he's back here reading books, and I got a letter in there that she donated $10,000 to the Tuskegee Airmen, even to roll over on his grave if he knew. <laughs> <laughs> Did that was Mrs. Anderson? Yeah. Mrs. Anderson? Sarah Anderson. Is That's the woman who donated the money? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, when they, I just told them how nice they treated us, you know. Yeah. Of course, her being from, Miss, or from Georgia. Georgia why they had no association with blacks and we played all sports and everything with them, they're great people. Did you ever meet any of these Tuskegee Airmen after yeah, the war? I, they had a meeting at, at the Wright Field or someplace and they were coming into them. Well, I went out to look for them and they were uh, children, aunts and uncles, everybody, but there were no Tuskegee Airmen there. There was, I was trying to find people who were there when I, we spent time there, and I couldn't find anybody at Wright Field that time. But they were all relatives, you know. Right. But uh, there weren't any of the, the real airmen that were there. Yeah. Um, They're dying off now pretty quick. Yes. The people from that generation. Yes. They're yeah. uh, not sticking around too long. There's not too many in as good a health as you are today. Well, I don't know. My nose keeps growing, though, when I tell these lies. <laughs> uh, so after that mission, uh, how many more missions did you have, would you say, after that one? 
after the after you there, landed there at the, the Tuskegee Airmen. I'd have to look at. I think the mission that day was up at Regensburg. It looks yeah. Uh, it looks to me like he had about eight or uh, about ten more missions after that. Yeah, but they were. We flew. Uh, uh, they had some e pretty easy missions. We, we went up and and uh, to Northern Italy and. Uh, British Eighth Army and the American Fifth uh, Army were up there in northern Italy. And we went over <coughs> just ahead of their lines, and because of the screw ups that they had when we dropped on wrong targets or something, they had strips of muslin. They were, I don't know, maybe 50 or 100 feet long and probably 20 feet wide, and they had one when we first came in, and they had two, and then they had three, and then where the front line was, they had them in like a T. And so we weren't to take the uh, bombs, uh, take the cotter pin out of the, the bomb and activate them until we were ready to drop the bomb. So we got in a frag front, and they would drop just wing on wing, you know. Once we got over there, we dropped them on the it was the Fifth Army of the Americans and the British Eighth Army, and uh, the German line was right above them. So as soon as we got over the front line, we dropped these fragmentation bombs trying to kill as many of those people. And then after the third day, or the, I don't know how many days we did that, I guess a couple days, why, uh, then they made their push off that, and then they stopped the Germans getting out of Italy, you know, and they were going up the Brenner Pass. And that's where they got uh, Mussolini. He was trying to get out of there. And uh, in fact, uh, I went to a little town up there in Milan. And with my policemen, they were going to turn in guns from the war. And we thought we'd get some Lugers or B-38s, handguns. Well, they handed in guns, but they were big rifles and had bayonets and everything on them. And we went around to these collecting stations. The guy gave us a driver to go around, and we're around here looking for little souvenir weapons. Well, they weren't turning; they didn't turn many Lugers or P-38s in there. They were just rifles and things like that. But that was an education. They took us around, and they had a picture of where we were at the gas station. And there was a picture of Mussolini and his girlfriend hanging upside down at this filling station. This is about three days after that had happened. But they had souvenir postcards from the hanging of Mussolini and his girlfriend there. Did you, uh, did you get any souvenirs to bring home? Well, I get, I, they let me come home alive. That was the <laughs> best thing that happened to me. Yeah. Now they, they treated me good. I was fine. They gave me two distinguished flying crosses. That was a little different. A lot of people got, you know, one, and one. when we flew our lead missions and things, well, they took care of us. What about uh, some of your <coughs> last missions before the, before? Well, that, that was right at the end of the war, and we were, like I say, we were trying to get ready for the British, or the, our fifth, uh, the American Fifth Army and the British Eighth Army. We were trying to drop all, or trying to stop the the Italians getting out of the Brenner Pass there. And once we cut that off, why, then the war was ready to get over, you know. And you read a lot about Brenner Pass, so you bombed Brenner Pass, oh, actually? Yeah. There's some pictures of the Brenner Pass in there. Yeah. Uh, uh, did you have anything, uh, any bomb runs when they invaded the southern part of France? No, I don't think I went on any. Okay. But uh, a lot of people, a lot of people that were in my uh, in the group when I got there, you know, had been the, the big one that was Palesti, you know, the oil refineries over there, and uh, I we didn't I didn't go to Palesti. We had a lot of friends that went to Palesti, and some of them got back, some of them didn't get back, you know. They lost a lot of planes on they that mission. They lost a lot of planes because they did low-level bombing, you know. They went in there real low. They weren't at twenty thousand feet when they were bombing Palesti. I no, I talked to a lot of guys that flew in World War II, and um, a lot of them, their hearing has been affected later yeah. in life. How about yours? I got a hearing aid in there, yeah. in the government. Yeah. And uh, they, 
The VA took care of that. What about yeah. frostbite? What? What about frostbite? Frostbite, uh, oh, you know, that'd clear up in a hurry if you get it on your face, you know. And mm -hmm. It would heal and they'd give you a salve to put on it. Yeah. But you didn't have, if it gets 50 below zero and that wind coming through a hole in, in the plane, it doesn't get on uh, the skin without disrupting it. Certainly. Um, while you're over there in Italy, did you get to go into town and get around civilians much? And well, you we did some, but there, uh, 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 we were down we were little towns and the, the sanitation was bad, you know, and the kids were out there with bare feet begging for candy or cigarettes and things, and our kids, you know, we wouldn't function too well right. at that level, but they, they did fine, and we could go into town. I'd had a picture of my wife from high school, and I had a, somebody in, from Foggia had painted a picture, I still got it back home, and he did a pretty good job, and I gave him a carton of cigarettes, I think, and that was in payment for the picture. Money didn't change hands, he gave him cigarettes. Or cigarettes was currency. Yeah. Yeah. But, uh, uh, where were you at when you when you flew your last mission? I don't know where the last mission was. I'd have to look on the thing. I think the last mission says um, the we were probably supporting the Narvesa Railroad Bridge or something like yeah, that. That may have been someplace up in the Brenner Pass. Trying uh -huh. to and then it says MA thirteen Italy and MA eighteen Italy on. Uh, 15 and 16 April of 1945. Well, that may have been where we were trying to bomb the front lines up there. Uh -huh. we, and and we, when we were through dropping all this flak on this infantry down there, then they made their push off and that's when they cut the Germans off so they couldn't get up the Brenner Pass. Do you remember your last mission? Do I remember? Yeah. Not as well as some of the others. It was wasn't milk runs, I'm sure, but it was probably up in northern Italy there or someplace. Are there any uh, particular missions you'd like to tell us about that stand out in your mind as hazardous or whatever have you? Oh, uh, I had a little card here I'd written a few things down on. Oh, here it is. Uh, The one uh, that was an interesting fellow, this Don Gentili, did I tell you about him? He's yep. from Piqua, Ohio, and he yep. was a leading ace of the European theater, and uh, President Roosevelt called him a one-man Air Force, and uh, I played football against him in high school. He was 20 years old when he graduated from high school, and I was so... Uh, he, he was five years older, and you weren't able to play. Nowadays, you know, you wouldn't be able to ever 20 or something, but uh, he was playing uh, football, and uh, I was trying to think. You played football against him? Yeah. Don I played, and he was, they, somebody wrote a book about him and, and said how he uses wingman, there's running interference for him as he's running for touchdowns. Well, I think he was either a guard or a center on the football when I looked at the program, you know. And I was about a 135-pound halfback <laughs> at the time. And, uh, but he was a couple years older. He was five years older. But uh, I was playing as a sophomore at that time, and he was probably about 20 years old at the time. <laughs> so it was a little different. Yeah, yeah. Uh, did you ever meet him after the war? Uh, which one? Don Gentile. No, I never no. met him, but I knew his his dad had a uh, bar in in Sydney or in Piqua, which is 13 miles from Sydney. And his wife, I met his sister. Uh, she was a good friend of uh, a doctor that I went and practiced with, and uh, did anesthesia at the hospital with, and. Uh, they were uh, 
they were down in, in Pickway, and when he was in high school, he took a plane and flew it under the bridge. Now, I don't know how much clearance it was down there, but uh, he was a hot shot at that time, but he was, you know, a few, he's about four years older than I was. But I think, and he, he was saying that, you know, he was playing football and running for touchdowns and things. I think he was a guard or a center on the football team. You know, I don't think he ever touched the ball, but they had ghost riders and embellished a little that he did in right. high school. Um, you know, um, I wanted to go back here to the uh, fellow who um, you say was one of the inventors of the jet plane. Yeah. Did you have, uh, when he uh, immigrated here and became a member of your church, yeah. did you have many conversations with him? Oh, yeah. I treated him. Called a, I had him in a, as an early patient. He had an emergency of some sort. And I went in like at 7.30 in the morning to see him. And we were talking about him. And it happened to be, that it was the night that they were, had flown the, the first landing in the moon, you know up there, and that was the next morning. I'm talking to him. I'm up at night watching the TV, <laughs> trying to see this, and he was telling me, you know, about some things, and his wife was a real nice lady. She was a soloist at our church, and uh, he was a dental patient and a good friend. What was his name again? Hans Bonohein. Bonohein. Bonohein, and he invented the jet, the 262. Uh -huh. That was his claim to fame. I see. A little better, better than my claims to fame. Well, perhaps. Well, uh, I'm sure of that. What else do you have there on your, your notes? Uh, huh? Well, I was trying to see what else I had on this. Well, this was about, uh, uh, Don Gentile, and we talked about him quite a bit. And uh, oh, I had one kind of interesting thing. My brother was up guard. He was in the field artillery, and uh, he flew in little Piper Cubs or Taylor craft planes, and they'd be up three, four thousand feet directing the artillery shells in. Well, when the war ended, he ended up uh, in. Uh, Nuremberg. Uh, yeah, at Nuremberg where they're having the war trials. And Goring was up there. And uh, the, he was uh, waiting. And I, I got a letter from him. He told me where he was. And the next day, I took a very pistol case, and uh, which we shoot the little flares up. And they're about three times the size of a 12 gauge shotgun thing. And I cut holes in the top of it, and then took a mattress cover, made like a tail on a kite then flew over this camp and dropped it about a, on the edge of a swimming pool in there and had my brother's name on it. And they gave it to him and the commanding officer heard about it and he wanted to know if he wanted to take a jeep and go into town and visit with me. Well, I'm down in Italy. It would have taken him three days to get to Italy to see where I was. And uh, but th that worked out fine. I got the, the letter that I'd sent him, you know, I dropped it out of a like I say, a very pistol case and with tail on a kite, you know, dropped it down to the camp. There. What kind of a plane were you flying when you did that? B-24. And you actually dropped it to where he could retrieve it? Oh, yeah. I dropped it down and put it like a tail on a kite, flew over the camp where they had Goring and all the war prisoners there, and I dropped the thing down. And my brother went fishing the day before, and they, there was a stream there, and my brother liked to hunt and fish pretty well. He's about eight years older than I was. And uh, they dropped uh, some grenades down in the river and in the hole where they knew, you know, the fish would be. And then they got downstream and the, the, the trout would come floating downstream. They were taking it out and they had a big dinner, you know, with his commanding officer. They, they invited him and he ate, he ate the trout, but they suggested they didn't do any more fishing with the grenades. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, what mission were you on that took you over to Nuremberg? Oh, yeah. I mean, you didn't just get in a plane and fly there to drop a message to your brother. Oh, no, this was after. 
uh, the war had been ended, you know, just a couple of days. Oh, and okay. I was taken, to, I said, well, I'd, they wanted me to, somebody to take these people on a tour of targets. So I took them to, I told them I'd take them to Munich and Linz and Vienna at the low level, and we'd fly a thousand feet over the, these okay. towns. Okay, now I and, But I said I wanted to go up and drop a note to my brother that I'd just gotten the day before, and that's when I made the tail on the kite and we dropped it down next to the swimming pool, and I've got a copy of the letters in there that I sent, I think I signed my name Morgan or something. I didn't like Wilbur very well. You signed your name what? Morgan, M-O-R-G-A-N. Well, some guy at camp, I was always mowing grass and had a little more money than some people at camp, and I'd loan people money. I'd always get the money back. But uh, they called me, the one guy who was in charge of the waterfront, who ended up being a good friend, he called me Morgan for, Morgenthal was the Secretary of the <laughs> Treasury at that time. So you were the money lender. I was the money lender, <laughs> but when we mow grass, he'd get, 15 cents or quarter or 35 cents or 50 yeah. cents for a big yard, you know. Now it's, you multiply well, that, that many times. That explains how you got over Nuremberg, of course, because uh, that was after the war was over. Yeah. yeah. They were guarding political prisoners up right. there, and he was with an artillery outfit, and he was flying a little Piper Cub or Taylor Craft, calling in fighter, and uh, he got a piece of metal that he got to put on a seat, you know, that he'd sit on there but he would call the fire in from a couple thousand feet and see where the artillery shells were right. landing, and then he'd tell them to you know, correct their position right. to do that. The, um, so when, when did you come home from uh, the war? When did I came home? Well, I, we finished, that was an interesting thing. They gave us a plane that had been marked for salvage about two months before and uh, we had to go up and calibrate the instruments and everything. Well, this thing was kind of mush along. If we had ever lost an engine, we'd never made it back. Well, we had to fly out to the Azores first. We flew down to North Africa first, I think, and then out to the Azores, the island that was owned by Portugal. And we went in there and then flew up to Nova Scotia and then down to Bradley Field up in New England and then got some other transportation back home. That was the end of the flying at Bradley Field. So that was right after the war, and I was interested in going back to school, you know. And uh, I started at Ohio State, and uh, uh, you know, I, I was about a week late getting into school there, but the lady let me carry 20 hours and gave me a lot of my electives out. So I got my pre-dent, which is normally two years the minimum, and a lot of people went three years, some went four years, and then went to dental school. Well, I when I, I got done in a hurry, and, uh, and then I, like I say, I played basketball up at Ohio State, and uh, the dean of the dental school was a Big Ten representative from Ohio State to the Big Ten, and uh, so we got along fine. I got in dental school in four quarters, rather than two years or three years or four years, so I was just lucky with the draw. I didn't, there wasn't any brilliance on my part. I had a good counselor there. When did you graduate? Uh, in 1950. From 1950 from dental school? Yeah. And uh, where did you set up your first practice at? In Kettering at uh, Stroop and Far Hills. I went in with a physician and we practiced and then I was doing anesthesia in the morning and then doing dentistry in the afternoon. But our fees and everything, we were charging, like I say, $15 for the first half hour and then $10 for each half hour after that. You'd do a gastric resection and make $45, that would be, uh, you'd add a couple of zeros on the end of that, you know. Today. Today, yeah. yeah. Um, when you came home from the war, you're, you're going to Ohio State. Have, have you met your wife yet? Oh yeah, we'd gone together in high school, then she went to that school up north called the University of Michigan. Oh. And she went up there for two years. Then I tell people we had to get married my GI Bill was running out and I needed some help. And uh, but she went two years to Michigan up there and uh, made some good friends. And what, was your, what is your wife's name? Letitia. And it her, was T, they, their nickname was T, but Letitia was her name. And her maiden name? Burke, B-U-R-K-E. I see. And uh, 
So she's going to Michigan while you're going to Ohio State? Yeah. And you've been to high school sweethearts? Yeah. And, uh, we got a little reprieve there for a couple of years. And then we got back together and she came down and we got married and she uh, put me through dental school. Where did you get married at? In Sydney, Ohio. Sydney? Yeah. And what was the Lutheran date? Church. Uh, the what? A Lutheran church. Um, and what was the date of that? Oh, you're asking me too quick here now. We got married in, well, probably 47. But she was up there two years. And then I graduated in 50. And they let me, I graduated with one year of free dent, playing basketball up there at Ohio State. They let me slide through there pretty quick. Uh -huh. So what was she doing to support you? Oh, she uh, worked at the Arts College office, was in charge of the Arts College office up there. They'd get the grades in and, and uh, took care of the office up there, the business part of it. Did you have your own little apartment somewhere? Oh yeah, we had an apartment. Off campus? We lived good. Yeah, we were playing like $50 a month for a real nice room. In fact, the fellow that took over our apartment was another dentist from my hometown. He's an orthodontist, and he used our couple places that we lived. He moved in after we moved out, and so that worked out fine. How long did you have your practice at Kettering? Kettering, well, I started in, we got out in 1950, and I interned at Maya Valley Hospital, and I did anesthesia for about seven years, but I did dentistry in the afternoon. But the fee schedule and everything, like I said, it was, $15 for the first half hour and $10 for each half hour after that. So you could do a gastric resection and charge, you know, $45, $50. Now it'd be, you could be four or $5,000, you know. Yeah. So I, it was pretty cheap when I was doing So how long did you do that there? I did that for eight years. Eight and then years. I had to decide what I was gonna do and I could have done anesthesia and I decided to do dentistry. And where did you set up practice at? At Stroop and Far Hills. Where? Stroop and Far Hills. Where, what? I went in practice with a Dr. Walters. He was a physician and he had taught school and he was about 40 years old when he graduated from college. And Wh uh, Where's that located at? Stroop and Far Hills in Kettering, Ohio. Oh, it's suburb like? Yeah, a suburb south of Dayton. Oakwood, go from Dayton to Oakwood to Kettering. I see. Um, and how long did you have your practice there? Quite a while, and then we built a building on Ron Road at uh, 60 West Ron Road and moved in there then. And uh, then we had one more office after that. Oh, no, that was at Stroop and Far Hills, I think. That was the last one that I had. So how long did you practice dentistry then? Well. I, oh, you actually I, I used to have, I had about 40 physicians and their families would come in as dental patients because I did anesthesia, knew everybody at the hospital and always gave them a discount, you know, and we didn't charge much and uh, fees and everything. Of, fees I think, and everything. Of I think your friend, Mr. Hartman, said you practiced for about 30 years. Well, he probably knows more about it than I do. Um, is this... Uh, um, uh, you said you got married in a Lutheran church. Yeah, are you a, Ohio. are you a Lutheran? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, the fellow Good that Shepherd, that Dick Hartman goes there, and then the, like is that I Missouri said, Senate by any no, chance? Uh -huh. American Lutheran. American Lutheran. Dick's got a couple kids that are that are uh, ministers in Lutheran churches. I see, uh, and that's the church that uh, the gentleman who. Uh, Invented Von Odine, Von Odine belong, yeah. he belonged to too. Yeah, his wife was a, was a soloist there. Yeah. That's why he got over there and why we got involved. Now, did you and your wife have any children? Yeah, we had, uh, we adopted two, and then we didn't know what caused it, and she got pregnant. We lost one, and it was the same time that the uh, Kennedys had one, their first baby, and uh, it was, he weighed about seven and a half pounds, big enough nowadays, so I, he'd have made it easy. But the Kennedys lost theirs and we lost ours just at the same time. And then we had two more. 
after that. Uh, so you adopted two children? We adopted two, then and lost one, and then and uh, had, two had, more. had two more. The two children you adopted, what were their names? Well, Steve was the oldest boy, and uh, Barbara, she lives up in uh, Troy, Ohio now. And then my daughter, the, my big caretaker that takes care of me, comes in about every three weeks and spends about three or four days and gets more work done than I can get done in six months while she comes in. She's got her two daughters who are just graduating from college. That's Barbara? No, this is Anne. Oh. And the, the one girl is uh, going to the University of Oregon, and the other girl is going to uh, Bates. It's a hard, right, it's a good school. She was in the upper one percentile of her uh, graduation, you know, and, and so, her, her testing and everything. So, so she could have gone any place she wanted. She applied for about nine schools, and once she got her acceptance up there, why she decided to go up there. To so if you would, what's, what's the names of your four children? Well, Steve. They, Steve is the oldest. Barbara. And, and Barbara. And those are the two that we adopted. adopted. And then we had Mark, and he was a boy that lived about the same age as the Kennedys lost their baby. And uh, then Ann and Paul. Ann and Paul. Yeah. Uh, and, and Paul died. I see. Paul, yeah, he yeah. died. He was a. Uh, he, what, who did he work for? Um, he was a financial manager, and he did pretty good. He took care of a lot of my investments later on, and he worked, things worked out well. He managed things, but he passed away. Your, uh, and your wife, is she still living? No, she passed away, oh, how many years ago? Five, two? Two years ago? No. Yeah. See, I'm not very good, but I don't know the difference between two and five. Well, <laughs> well your nose went back in. <laughs> That's, uh, That's good what? That's good to remember. Now, uh, what church do you currently belong to? Where uh, the, the preacher over there is, Dick Hartman. Are you a minister? No. no. Oh. He, he's got a couple of sons that are son Lutheran son ministers. So. Oh, yes. That's uh, where we started over there. You're still a member of the Lutheran yeah. Church, though. So, uh, they haven't asked me to sing in the choir, so did, uh, they haven't asked me. <laughs> <laughs> Have you, uh, after the war, did you get together with any of your uh, buddies from uh, from yeah. your squadron? Oh yeah, I had. We had some reunions and come back. We went back to Italy a couple times, and uh, we had some good tours over there, and some that weren't very good, but. Some of them were very good. They went to all of our bases where we were stationed, everything. And uh, some of them knew how to do to get a, get you off the road and get into places to eat before there was any rush and back on the bus and in front of the line. And otherwise, well, you just spent your time trying to get around. <laughs> yeah. Have you been in contact lately or recently with any of your buddies? Well, for some reason, they're dying off. I don't have too many of my buddies left. They're, all my crew members are gone. And, all of them are gone. Yeah. Did any of them live around here in Ohio, Kentucky? No. Mm -hmm. oh. no my, the family that I was closest to is my pilot's wife, and I'm in touch with their kids, you know, and everything. And good friends, they'll come back. Uh, at this point, I'd like to see if Brian has any, uh, Brian Powers, who really heads this Veterans History Project, if he has any uh, questions to ask. Yeah, I have a couple of questions. I was wondering the airstrip in, that you flew out of. Yeah, it was all metal strip. There was no cement strip. That's what I, what I was going to ask. What, were the, what was that like? What was the airstrip? Uh, well, the they, they would grind the, I wasn't there when they built the airstrip in there, but they, use the metal strips, you know, that they would tie together, and they worked out quite well, and then the planes were stationed around. You'd have normally four squadrons to your group and four groups to the wing. They would be in a pretty close area. And, uh, but to your four squadrons, you had activities with the, those four squadrons pretty, 
pretty close. The rest of them, you'd see it briefing or something, that's all. Was there like anything like an equivalent of air traffic control? No, we didn't have it. They had a, they had a, uh, somebody that was up there directing, telling them when to, to go. I, I was in the plane. I wasn't doing any work till we got airborne and we were ready to leave to go on the mission. Then I would give directions after that time. Did they train you or, or, or give you any kind of, uh, uh, I guess, training in case, you know, you crashed and got captured? What were some of your instructions? Uh, oh, they gave you a $50 United States bill the U.S. thing, and it was they had a note in there written in a different language, take you to the nearest uh, Allied headquarters. You know, and they would be reprimanded or be reimbursed for anything that they gave us. Um, I was curious to know: uh, Do you remember hearing the news about when FDR passed away? If what? When FDR passed away. What were you doing? Did you remember hearing about that? Oh, yeah. Uh, I was trying to think when he got, when he died. It was uh, April the 12th of 45. April. Uh, you I was home when they, when they dropped the bomb on Hiroshima or Nagasaki, those two. I was in downtown Dayton at that time. And I was going to, uh, before I went overseas, I was going to take some more training or I wasn't interested in flying any more missions and I didn't have to. Were you, did it look like you might be sent to the Pacific Theater? Well, I didn't know the war was still going on. But when I was home, they dropped the A-bomb on Nagasaki or Hiroshima, one of the two or whatever. Mm -hmm. But I was home on leave at that time. So I w they shipped me back out to California, and I think I went down uh, at some naval air base and flew four hours with them one day so I could get my flight paid. <laughs> and then they just sent me back to give me discharge, and I started back to school. But did you, did you think you were going to, if, if, the, if the war with the Japanese continued, do you think you would have been assigned? I don't know what they were going to do. I wasn't going to volunteer for anything. I, been shot at enough over there that one trip. I knew I was very lucky to be alive. So uh, I, I didn't plan to go back there. There's something I wasn't going to, I was going to take further training or do something. I didn't, I didn't have any real plan, but I knew I didn't want to go over and be shot at by the Japanese for another couple of years. Did you get much of a chance to travel around like when you were in Italy or? Oh yeah, I spent a lot of time. We'd go up to Rome, and uh, they had uh, the Savoy and Regina hotels, or the two hotels that the Air Force had, and uh, they were nice uh, things. People going back and visit those hotels now, and it wasn't like uh, I think it was something like a dollar and a half a day or something to stay in the hotel, and you could sell a carton of cigarettes or a mattress cover for 15 or 25 dollars, so you had spending money while you were in, the, in, in Rome or the thing. Did you uh, interact much with the Italians? Which, did you have much encounters or anything? Come well, could we turn the thing off? No, I'm kidding. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was a young boy, <laughs> 19, <laughs> 19 or 20 years old, <laughs> in fact. One of the funny things, when I got back from the war, uh, I, we took a trip out to California, and Larry, the policeman that was 29 years old, uh, he meets at the, at the airport. He's got a stack of pictures. He's been taking pictures. I didn't take my pictures over there. First pictures, he and I are at a hotel eating dinner with a couple of Italian girls. I don't know. I think he invited them. I didn't. So that was uh, his first picture. <laughs> well, I shuffled through the pictures pretty quick before we had any more explaining to do. <laughs> uh, well, we talked. You talked several times about the guy who who uh, was part of your church, the German. 
Uh -huh. That's classic. Well, what was he doing in Dayton? Was he, was he? He was sent back with the guy that was in charge of the rockets. What was his name? Uh, von, uh, von Braun. Von Braun. He was Hitler's whiz kids, those kids, the two of them. One invented the airplane, in fact, when he flew his first flight, he went out and went in a, a boat. He had a sailboat and went out that afternoon. The rest of them were in there drinking champagne and celebrating. But he went out in his little boat and went on a boat ride that day and went back. He was a good man. Well, what was it? He was in the Dayton area. Well, yeah, he, he, he married a girl that was a soloist at our church. Yeah, how, well, how he was the right connection. Okay. Is that how he ends? He was there for yeah, and, and he's been inducted into the Hall of Fame. Too. How do you spell he his last the name? The Aviation Hall of Fame. The Aviation Capital O H A I M. Von Oheim. Von Oheim. Von Oheim. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, well, he and the other guy that was shooting those rockets up there, they were. They were Hitler's whiz kids, you know. Uh -huh. I guess he's not around anymore. Huh? No, he's passed away. His wife, I know, is, may still be living, and was a real good piano player. And, uh, and was she American? His wife? Or was she, yeah. yeah. She. You know how they met? Well, I, I guess think at church some way. I don't know, but she was German originally, and uh, they met and ended up getting married. They had a good marriage, and she was German. He, they conduct themselves real well. Was she German? From? But she was a naturalized American citizen. Yeah, but she was born in Germany? I think so. Yeah, I see. Uh, did, 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 he talk to, did he talk to you about Hitler or any, any interaction with Hitler? Oh, not too much. He came to the dental office one day on an emergency, and it was the day that we put our first shot on the moon, and there was no, there was no people that were on that. It was just a plane that we landed something on the moon the day and he was on that I had him as a patient that day and he was telling me how simple it was I was waking up every two hours trying to tune in see if they're going to land <laughs> this thing I knew nothing about it and uh, and he told you how simple it was oh you know, he, he explained it pretty easy I thought it was pretty easy for him wouldn't have been very easy for me now or then or anything Pat, do you have any other questions? Well, you forgot to tell them uh, about your Ohio State basketball experience and playing in the NCAA. Well, in those years, it was a little different. You had to win your conference championship to get into the NCAA. So they had about 13 teams that got into the NCAA. And we got beat in the semifinals of the, uh, by North Carolina in overtime. I played more in that game than any game I played all year. That may have been the reason we lost. I'm not sure. What position did you play? I was a guard. I'm a little guy. I was only 6'2". Did you have a question? Uh, Mr. Hartman? I've got a lot of questions, but I'll ask those later. Well, I just have one last question. It's not really military-related. But how did you decide to become a dentist? How did I decide to become a dentist? Well, um, Oh, that's a good question. I was going to be an engineer. Everybody's going to be an engineer. I was going to go over to Purdue and play basketball. I went over and talked to Piggy Lambert, the coach over there, and told him I was going to do that. And then I came, uh, came back to Dayton and played golf with a dentist that came back. And he said, well, well, the government's going to pay for your thing. Why don't you go to medical school or dental school? And uh, so I decided to go to I, I Only time I'd been to a dentist growing up, I, had a tooth chipped or something in football, and they, somebody buffed it off a little bit. So uh, I, it wasn't any long-term love that got me into dentistry, but it worked out fine. And doing the anesthesia and having all the physicians that I had my practice for was good. Wilbur, uh, Patricia were married uh, over 60 years, 62 years, something like that. You were married over 62 years, Mr. Hartman yeah. said. Mm -hmm. yeah. You, uh, while you're uh, going to school under the GI Bill, what exactly did the GI Bill pay? Fifty dollars, but I think we got seventy-five dollars when we went to school. That was once a month they had sent us a thing, but that paid for a lot, and they gave us free, you know, tuition and uh, in dental school. There's a lot of 
the expense involved with that, you know, and I got that free from the government, you know. So they paid you seventy-five dollars a month plus tuition. Yeah. You know. And how long did they provide that, doctor? Well, I told people that that's why we had to get married in my GI Bill. It wasn't running out, so it lasted all the time. Oh, that's so, oh, that's when your nose was growing yeah, a little bit. <laughs> We had to get married. Well, that wouldn't shock anybody anymore. <laughs> <laughs> no. Uh, yeah, yes. Um, and this kind of goes back to your time in the military. Um, what kind of preparation would you do before you go on mission for like your plane and as a navigator? What kind of preparation would you make to go on mission? To go on a mission? Well, you'd go up to group headquarters and get you up about five o'clock in the morning. And you're going to take off about eight o'clock because you normally over the target about noon, about four hours. So you get up about five o'clock and uh, go in and eat. You get breakfast, and uh, they, once you got up there, you knew the target that you were going to go to, and uh, you knew what route you were going to go. And they had a, normally a, a, a big auditorium. And they'd have the yarn, red yarn going once you got up to the, to the going across the enemy land, what the coordinates were there, and where you made your first turn and second turn. Normally, you didn't go directly to the target. And uh, they'd go through briefing, and they'd tell you where you were going to go, and they'd, the group commander, it all depends, the toughest missions we had, we had a guy named Colonel Steed, and he graduated from West Point. And they dropped short on a target one day, and they hit a British hospital, which didn't go over too well. And he was a West Point graduate. And so if he signed up to go on a mission, it wasn't an easy mission. <laughs> he, he normally went with some of the toughies. And he'd flown with us on some missions, you know, where he would fly on the plane, fly as a co-pilot. We'd relieve the co-pilot. And he would fly in, not, not as a pilot, but as a, a co pilot. Uh, what was some of the preparation on the actual plane uh, before you would take off? You what? Uh, what was some of the preparation for the plane, your plane, uh, before you were to take off? Like pre flight. Yeah, pre flight. Oh. Well, you knew where you were flying in formation. If you were in Able Box, there'd be in your a group, you had four different. Uh, squadrons, and you'd have maybe eight or ten planes, maybe eleven, in a in a uh, squadron, and uh, you knew where you were in takeoff. If you were going to be the first box or the second box or the third box in your group, you know, was going. And sometimes when you're flying group lead, where well, you lead the wing too. And I know one thing I got in there that I got a DF a distinguished flying cross was to. To, uh, to go to the, um, uh, the no, I'm drawing a blank. Uh, I get I get talking and I, I well, my, my he, he just wondered what you did when you got in the plane to be the navigator. Oh. What did you do just before you? Oh, I'd get in there I, as soon as I went to briefing. I knew the target and all the coordinates of any turns and things we were going to make. And then I would draw that out on my map that I had. I got a sectional map. Is that over there? Right there. Huh? Yeah. That, that's just a sectional map. You know. This doesn't go up very far. Here's Italy down here, and here's the. Uh, there's that little spur coming out yeah. of Italy that you talked about. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now oh, this is the one right here. This is where we crash landed with the Negro fighter strip. Was right here. My pilot, uh, like I say, he never had anything to do with blacks, or, but his wife donated. There's a letter. That she so, you, you put your coordinates on your map, and then what did you do? 
Well, in the plane. Oh, in the plane. Before takeoff. Well, I had a smaller map than I had, and uh, I would know where I was going to be and at what time I had to be at this area up here. If we were flying lead, why we had to go over enemy landfall at a certain time, then we flew out at 150 miles an hour. And if you had a tailwind, you went a little faster. If you had a wind coming at you, you went a little slower. Where is and you tried to drop your bombs going downwind so you could have as much speed as you could over the target. Where is your base at, your home base at on that map? That, that. Right in here. Here's Foggia. Right here. Here's the spur of the... Yes. Okay. And you're 20 miles north of Spo Foggia. Yeah. Okay. And it's all, yeah, okay, right up there near the spur, you said. Yeah. This is northern Italy. Or mm -hmm. Well, I, actually what he would do is once he got into his navigator's position, he would, he would plot the target. He would, you had like a compass and a, and a uh, ruler, and you would plot your target to certain coordinates, and then it would show the, the new coordinates, and he would plot his, his turn, right turn, Left turn. We, we'd fly in at a certain speed. I think it's about 150 miles an hour. If you got a downwind, when you might be, you'd like to go over the target downwind. You didn't want to go upwind when we were slowing down and spending more time. So you're over the target about five minutes where they could shoot at you. I don't know if you were inquiring about the mechanical aspects or not, but the mechanical things would be taken care of when they come back from a mission. When your flight engineer would go over the uh, aircraft. Uh, there would be what they call preventative maintenance. Yeah, I, was, I was wondering about that. Would they go over before the flight, go over, uh, make sure the engines were working properly and all that the flight on? Well, I've been, they, they, would they, they, they would do that at, at night when they, when they come back. When they come back, they'd I mean, make they sure. Yeah, the plane, after they saw how many holes or if they lost an engine or what had to be replaced on the plane, they'd take care of it. They had maintenance that worked all through the night, you know, getting the planes ready. And they might have to wait a couple of days to get that plane back on the flight line, but they knew what planes were going to fly the next day. I was, I was wondering, you do something, I hear that people do it before mission, you know, people do it after mission, so I, just, I was wondering when, you know, would they do the pre-flight check to make sure all the equipment was working properly? Well, they would do that after the mission, if there's any repair or anything that had to be replaced on the plane, that would be taking care of that. But after they're, they're ready to, to fly away, uh, everything had been checked out pretty well. The planes that were assigned to fly were supposedly able to fly. When we came back, they gave us a plane that had been marked for salvage about two months before, and everybody was anxious to come back. And they got, uh, we got 10 boys from uh, B-17 outfits. From, we had one group of B-17 and uh, my pilot and the bombardier and myself, we, the three of us had a plane to take back. So I went up the day before and we calibrated the instruments and everything. And this thing, if we'd lost an engine, wouldn't have been very good. We had to, we put the lightest person we had back in the waist of the ship and everybody went up, everybody else, the 14 of us were up forward of the bomb bay. So they were up in the nose part of the ship laying in there aisle and everything, but that's because the plane had just much, we couldn't level the plane off, and we didn't get that weight up there forward, so we weren't going to do much flying if we got in trouble, but everybody was anxious to get home, and that's when we flew out to the Azores, and the one thing about the Azores I got, I, they had a soda bottle, you drink scotch and soda, and they rather than having a cap on the bottle, it was restricted at the top, and then a, in, in the top of the bottle, it had a marble, and the bubbles from the thing would seal the marble. And if you wanted to pour a drink or pour the soda, you'd press on the marble, tip the bottle, and you could pour the soda in your glass with your booze. So that's how I learned to drink scotch and soda, was to get the marble, marble booze in the bottle. Oh um, did, I wanted to ask you, how many missions did Colonel Steve fly with you? I don't know. If we had tough ones, I didn't like to see him at the mission because he, they messed up that one time and they dropped on a British hospital. And uh, he, he graduated from West Point 
And he didn't like that too well. So yeah. I was, we never had any trouble with him. You know, he was always a good man, but we, we knew he showed up. It wasn't going to be a milk run. Yeah. It was a big target. Did uh, Captain Hyde fly with you many times? Or? I never remember flying with him. Uh -huh. I see. Uh, how, how many bombs and what size bombs would you carry on the usual mission? Oh, well, they all depends what you were bombing. If you were bombing a bridge, you drop you know thousand pound bombs on those, and you had five hundred pound bombs, and you might use those in a marshaling yard or an oil refinery, something like that, or you might drop fragmentation bombs if you're trying to kill people on the ground, you know. And, uh, Did you ever drop any incendiary bombs? Yeah. Yeah, they'd start fires. They, yeah. That, around the oil refineries and things, you'd want to get something burned. But if you went in there and you looked up there and you saw Vienna and Munich and Linz, if you didn't like that, you're looking for the milk runs, but we didn't get many milk runs until <laughs> we got about 15 missions in there, and then they got a few in there. Uh -huh. But then you might be going to a Blue Spear bomb or some oil refinery someplace. Uh -huh. Will, did, uh, did the Red Tails uh, escort you on every flight you had? Not on every flight, but they were very good. They treated us great. And we like to see them because if they had a straggler that had to come back, uh, they would send three or four planes back with them. They wouldn't send one back. And then the Germans, well, they're not as apt to go up there and, and try to shoot down a plane that had three engines going and they had four planes escorting them. But that was their thing. They, they had a good number that would go back with the, the slowest plane or the disabled plane. Well, I have heard that before the Red Tails, some of the American pilots, uh, they, would, they would leave the bomber formation and go out chasing the German pilots, whereas the Red Tails, they always stayed took the, the took the pilot. I never heard that, but that's a true statement. <laughs> yeah, they, they protected, and they had a re really good uh, success rate in getting people back alive, you know. And they send three or four planes back, and they had a straggler coming back with a one plane up there where they could up send three or four up there and shoot that plane down and shoot the bomber down pretty easy. Well, uh, Brian, do you have any more questions? Well, I guess since we're talking about the Red Tails, did you see that movie that came out a few years ago on the, on the Red Tails? I, they had a couple movies on the Red Tails. Did you see any of them? Yeah, I saw both of them. What was your opinion of it? Did it they, was good. Did they, did they one was more Hollywood than the other one. Right. I forget now about it, but I know one was pretty factual and the other was a little more Hollywood. Okay. But they treated us great. They were good people. Even if my pilot didn't think much of them, but her, his wife, like I say, I got that letter there that she donated $10,000 to them. I don't know that they made any more gifts, anything, any bigger than that. <laughs> Mr. Well, Hartman, do you have any other questions? No, I just came in to eat one. And, <laughs> well. This picture here of the B-24, it says Sugar Baby. Did yeah, you fly that, in that? Yeah, that was our, that was what we named the plane, the pilot named his, uh, this plane that they were assigned to us. We didn't fly it that often, but it was a lead plane, and they put the logo on there. And he, it's a nickname that he gave her was Sugar Baby. But it wasn't the only plane we flew. We just flew whatever lead plane they it was assigned that day. Uh-huh. Something dropped on the floor. I don't know what that is. Well, Will, uh, do you have anything else you want to add? None that I know of. Well, I don't know if I, can. I want to take this opportunity then. Uh, well, do you want to look you. and see if there's anything else no, you want to add first? I don't think there's anything in there. I, I got that yellow sheet. I had some yeah, stuff on the back. I didn't know you could write. I don't write very well, I'll tell you that. I told you about Ralph up at Nuremberg, my brother. Yes. And. Uh, the, uh, staying, uh, going to the Azores, yeah. we were uh, 
that was when my pilot was going to take us into the Azores, and uh, they had a split beam on that thing. And I told him that we we're going to have to make a correction and, and fly to our left. And they had a split beam, and we're going out in this plane with 15 people on that plane and couldn't hardly get it level off to fly. And uh, we got, I finally convinced him, told him to turn his radio <laughs> compass on, and the thing went to 270. They had a split beam there, and oh. we'd have been out there in that ocean with a bad plane. And uh, he made, we made the correction. And made he let me take the plane on into the base. That's when we got to the Azores, I started drinking scotch out of the bottle that had the marble oh, yeah. on the top to see. Yeah. That was my best thing that happened in the Azores. Well, it's a good thing you made that correction. Oh, yeah. Or we wouldn't be talking to you now, I wouldn't well, think. Uh, why not? Uh, that, uh, yeah, I had a lot of lucky breaks. You had to refuel there, of course. Yeah, yeah. we did refuel. <laughs> yeah, you had to, certainly. Yeah. Yep. Well, I want to tell you this has been a wonderful interview, very enlightening, very educational, and I want to tell you how much I appreciate this interview with you, and I want to thank you for your service to our country. Well, when my nose stops growing, I'll be all right. All right. Thank, thank you again, sir. Thank you.